The Virginia Dynasties, The Emergence of King Carter and the Golden Age, was published in 1969 and was one of the last books authored by Clifford Doughty. While the author may have been noted for his involvement in writing works concerning the Lost Cause movement, I believe that his greatest book had nothing to do with Robert E. Lee, but it did have to do with his ancestor, Robert Carter. Covering roughly 70 years of Virginia history, the Virginia Dynasties does not focus on the infancy of the colony, during which Jamestown was carved out of the marshes, but rather on what occurred a little over halfway through the 17th century and into the first three decades of the 18th. Prior to this moment, a new cast of immigrants began flooding into the colony, individuals such as Richard Lee and John Carter. They are referred to in Dowdy's book as the first generation of immigrants. Arriving with bold New World intentions, they eventually became large landowners, in the process gaining political positions within what became called the Green Spring Faction. In 1660, Sir William Barclay began his second term as governor of the colony. Situated at Green Spring, Barclay's mansion near Jamestown, a somewhat despotic court began to emerge, into which Barclay became an outright ruler of the colony. Meanwhile, in Northern Virginia, frontier settlers struggled to survive hostility with Native Americans, resulting in warfare with the Doag and Susquehannock tribes, led by Colonel John Washington. These battles were technically illegal, since Berkeley had to give sanction to the planters for fighting the Indians. Eventually, impatient frontiersmen called on Nathaniel Bacon, a member of Berkeley's court, to bring their cause to the governor. Barclay's refusal to Bacon had a dramatic outcome, as Bacon's rebellion would divide the colony. At the same time, the second generation of emigrants appeared on the scene. The three Williams, William Randolph, William Fitzhugh, and William Byrd, extended the land accusations of the first generation, and for the most part, took neutral sides in the rebellion. Also at this time, a teenage Robert Carter was reading law books at his older brother John's plantation. Corotoman on the Rappahannock River. Throughout much of the Virginia dynasties, Clifford Doughty traces the life of Robert Carter, who was so powerful that his contemporaries called him king. Doughty believed that Carter, rather than other colonial politicians like William Byrd II, whose diary reflects the life of a London dilettante, should be considered the archetypal merchant planter. In many ways, Carter perfectly represented the economic interests of his fellow politicians, and most importantly, the oligarchy. After Bacon's rebellion, wealthy politicians began emerging even more powerful than the royal governor, partly because they were economically vital to the prosperity of the colony. At this stage, a native power block emerged, with which transplanted governors had to become acquainted with the reality of power. Successive governors, one after another, were deposed by the oligarchy, and in particular by James Blair, the religious leader in Virginia. The aristocracy were successful at getting both Sir Francis Nicholson and Sir Edmund Andros expelled from their office. In 1710, Alexander Spotswood was created lieutenant governor of the colony, and it was not long before the oligarchy realized they shared the same interests as him. Like men such as Carter, Spotswood sought personal wealth and influence, and this clash of interests created tensions between the aristocracy and the titled authority. While Spotswood is credited with developing infrastructure in Williamsburg, some of his other schemes, such as mining, were unsuccessful, eventually leading to his deposition in 1722. As Carter grew older, his fortunes grew larger, and it was around this time that he reached the height of his political career. In 1726, Carter was made acting governor of Virginia, thus receiving the highest and most respected title in his lifetime, apart from the president of the governor's council and speaker of the House of Burgesses. Very passionate about the education of his children, his daughter, Judith Carter Page, was noted for her intelligence in a world where women received little practical education. His descendants carried on his political and fortune-founding legacy, as among them include 
Robert E. Lee, William Henry Harrison, Benjamin Harrison, Fairfax Harrison, Cotter Henry Harrison, Harry Flood Byrd, and Richard E. Byrd. By Carter's death in 1732, the oligarchy which he had helped to form had become accepted in society and tolerated by Carter's successor as governor, Sir William Gooch. This type of authority over the colony's governors was no longer seen as rebellion as it was in Barclay's day, but rather as a cooperative relationship between economics and politics. Because of this climate, ambitious people like Thomas Jefferson were able to prosper as revolutionaries. Clifford Dowdy's book encompasses the formative years of the Virginia state, setting it up for future conflicts and victories, and demonstrating how a state can evolve toward independence.